It made headlines internationally when Bruce Jenner declared he now identifies as a woman. My heart and my soul and everything that I do in life, um, it is part of me. That female side is part of me. That's who I am. Australian Penny Clifford has a lot of compassion for him. She was born a boy but never felt she was in the right body. But it took her 10 years to transition. She had a sex change in the late 80s when it was still fairly rare. Now at 54, she says it's still the best decision that she's ever made. And she hopes by sharing her story, she'll break down some of the stigma about being transgender. Penny, thank you so much for joining Resilience. Thank you. Now, I want to take you right back to the beginning. When did you first feel like something was a bit different about you? I think it was around six or seven years of age and, and I wouldn't play with the boys. I'd always play with the girls and it was like a, it was a natural choice to go skipping and, and, you know, I didn't think about it at the time, but then, you know, of course it started coming up that I just was more effeminate and always went that way. I would choose to go and play with the girls and I would choose to play with dolls and, and yeah, it was very early on. And even your brothers and sisters wouldn't call you by your boy name, they'd give you a No, girl name. I had a, even my Christmas cards, my birthday cards, they just made my boy's name into a girl's name and, and that's like an early memory and, and yeah. I always just got called that. So what was your boy name? Daryl. You don't like even no. hearing that name, do you? You're very lucky. <laughs> I don't say it very often. And so I would, I, I, I don't have them anymore, but I would have birthday cards that would say to Darlene, happy mm. birthday. A and it wasn't meant in a nasty way. It was just a fun thing that I had between my brothers and sisters. So then as you got older and you were sort of 15, 16 and started to think about your sexuality and things like that, what happened, what's happened around then? I think even earlier, around maybe nine or ten, I was one of those kids that would dance around and on the weekends I would do shows for mum and dad in the backyard. In my early teenage years, that was when I was starting to question why I would feel that way. And, and like a lot of transgender people, I thought early on that maybe I was just gay. And, but I was a very feminine gay. But the thing is, when you were starting to question, it wasn't like you could Google. No, not at all. It, there, there wasn't, you know, on TV back in the day, there was nothing like you would see nowadays that, you know, educates people. Strangely enough, I think it was, a, was 11 or 12 before I even realised that girls had vaginas and boys had penises. And wow. it sounds ridiculous to say, but I really didn't know that there was a difference. Huge difference. No. Yeah. So when you were trying to find out more information. You were going to the library? Local library, where I grew up at Regent's Park. I don't think I researched just transgender. It was more about, you know, you, a lot of books back then were gay, about effeminate gays, drags, dressing up, you know. But then I, I sort of stumbled on a couple of books that really did make some difference to me, you know, and, and some information like Renee Richards, the tennis player, she wrote a book called Second Serve. And there was another book by an author, Jan Morris, called Conundrum. And so some of those really made a difference to me around 14 and 15, you know. At the same time, I was shopping with my family and, and Carlotta and Lay Girls were doing a, a guest spot at Bankstown Square Shopping Centre. And I remember my, my mum leaning down and saying, they're actually men dressed as women. And that's... Do you think I, she knew and she was trying to highlight it uh, for you or...? Possibly, you know, yeah. possibly. I mean, I was very effeminate. You, yeah. you, you, you've seen some of the photos, you know, yeah. it, it's just, yeah. More girly than I was. Oh God, <laughs> you know, more mints than a hamburger as I, you know, the old adage. So I, I think possibly. So back in those days, when you decided that you did want to transition, it was actually something that you had to go through a lot of psychiatric counselling. Talk me a little bit through the process. Once I figured out that I wanted to be transgender and I wanted to see shows. And then, you know, just through meeting some friends, I found there was a, a show called uh, International Vanities at, at Capriccio's nightclub on Oxford Street. And I remember, you know, there was no such thing as checking your ID back in the day. And so I remember that I would catch the train in and, and see the show and, and meet some of the other transgender girls. And, and I think that was around 16 and a half. Wow. And, and, you know, I remember getting my driver's license and thinking, wow, this is great, you know, because by that stage I'd met some friends who also 
liked the shows and liked the showgirl side of it. And that's the way I leaned my whole life, being, you know, dancing for mum and dad. And I just remember thinking, that's what I want to be. I want to be that stunning showgirl. So to do that... You needed to transition yeah. because to be a showgirl, you needed to look like a woman. You know, it was the illusion. It was more to be a female impersonator rather than a drag queen. And to do that, you needed to be soft and feminine and have breasts. And that's everything that ticked the boxes for me at the time. So tell me about transitioning. So I went to some doctors and they prescribed hormones. And I started taking some hormones probably around 19, mm -hmm. 20. Tell me about the moment you put that first hormone. Was it a pill? It was a tablet, yeah. When you swallowed it for the very first time. Was just, it like yeah, down was, the rabbit hole? It that's was so okay. exciting, you know, and it was like, can I take another one? You know, <laughs> and, and then I found that you can overdose on them. Yeah, so like not really overdose in a bad way, but overdose yeah. to make yourself sick. So I, I just, and you know, then the, you would have a hormone shot at the doctors every week. And, and so they were exciting times. And, and, you know, when your nipples would start to get a little bit hard and grow a little bit. And, you know, I remember the first time that I couldn't roll over on my stomach anymore because there were, there were little boobs, boobs and, I, you know, you would jump out of bed and scream, you know, because it was exciting. So, but not everything about transitioning was exciting and fun. No. It was really hard, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was, I mean, I was exceptionally tall, as you know. I had a decent beard mm -hmm. at the time and so I had to go through a very bad androgynous period where, you know, at night it was easy to cover it up. And, you know, I, I had entered some talent contests to combine transitioning and being a showgirl, uh, you know, because I still honestly believe if I had been born a woman, I still would have been a, a showgirl. Right. You know, I think that, that was your destiny. That was something that I was meant to do. And, and so I would have been that showgirl, but I needed to transition to be the showgirl that I wanted to be. I remember often going out, you know, skulking around and, you know, head down and not wanting to see, you know, there was a, an effect a feminine face that was changing because hormones would shift the muscle tone. Like really? it, it would soften you up in places and give you hips and, and just make you softer than what you were. I mean, you can see that in a Bruce, in Bruce mm -hmm. Jenner's interview now. He's been on hormones I see now for a year. You can see that he doesn't look like Bruce Jenner anymore. He's soft. Hormones are a miracle drug, what they can do for you and how they soften you up and how they make you think differently about yourself too. And it even heightens your voice a little bit. There's so mm -hmm. many things that it does over a long period of time. And I can just see that while a lot of people are going, you know, how could Bruce Jenner be a woman? I can see can that see it, it. it's good. He, you know, I mean, he's tall like me. We're the same height, mm. you know, and if I've managed to get through 54 years, <laughs> you know, he can do the same. So when you had the sex change in 1989, how much did it cost? It was 16,000, just a little bit over 16,000. Uh, I'd saved up for quite a long time performing and doing shows and it took me a while, but I remember when I got enough money for the surgery and I wrote that check out and yeah. took it to the doctor, it was like, okay, here we go. Tell me about some of the, the psych um, sessions that you had to have, because it was yeah. quite intense, wasn't you, it? There are a lot of um, transgenders that don't go for the sex change straight away. Um, for some reason, it was always one of the earliest things I wanted to do. I, I had a, a nose job in 1985. Um, that was important to me because I had, you know, a Sam Toucan, <laughs> huge, massive nose, and I really wanted that gone. But then um, to have that sex change, I had to see a psychiatrist, and it was a, a government-approved psychiatrist in Des Moines, and, and I needed to see him every week for three years. Three years? Yeah. And that was do, the only do they do that now? I'm, I think it's a year. Right. And <clears throat> I don't, it's not as hard as it used to be. Yeah. But back then in the day. Is that though, do you think that part of that is a good thing? That you have that amount of counselling so that you are 100% sure? Because sure. there's no turning back. No, you can't grow it back no. once it's gone. And I, while I found it hard, you know, especially because by this stage of my showgirl career, I'd won the talent contests and got into the big shows and was asked to join, you know, from guest spots at Lay Girls, asked to join the biggest touring show in Sydney, which was Simone and Monique's Playgirls, which was for a showgirl like myself, was Hollywood. You know, yeah. I thought I'd, you know, I'd made it. So, but I needed to travel because we were doing casino circuits around Australia for years on end. And so every time I would go off to do a three-month 
casino circuit or a year's casino circuit, the psychiatrist would make me start again. So oh. the, the process of trying to get approved for my sex change was hard, but I needed to do the shows so I could afford the $16,000 for, for, for the vagina. Yeah. You said to me that when um, you went to claim some of your Medicare, that it was a bit of a shock. Yeah, I went to HCF to claim the hospital back because I was in the hospital for two and a half weeks, so that was extra money. Mm. And uh, the, the information that was given to me to claim back was saying castration of penis and construction of artificial vagina that I had to hand over it at HCF and I remember some intern yes and I had to hand it over to one person but then by the time I got called back to go to the desk there were five people standing at the oh desk waiting to see me and I, I thought if they just want to see the vagina let me know <laughs> I'll do a leg spread for them but do a flash it doesn't take me long okay so I'm gonna go there because I really want to know and please forgive me if it's really prying but when you went in for the sex change, tell me what happens. With me, I saw a, a gynaecologist in Macquarie Street. And most of my doctors were back in the day because I, you know, they were the better doctors. Mm -hmm. I saw a few different doctors. There were two at the time in Sydney, um, a plastic surgeon called Dr. Hirsch, and then there was Dr. Howe in Macquarie Street, the gynaecologist. I chose him because I thought he just seemed better. He knew what he was talking about. So... Mm -hmm. it, so... They lop the penis off. That bit I can visualise, no problem. They they don't they actually create a they vagina? don't actually lop it off. They use a lot of the nerve endings, so they actually nearly hollow it out and invert it inside. So the nerve endings are what creates your vaginal canal. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, so that so you can still orgasm afterwards. Wow. And so they they take a lot of the dead meat out, and you know it gets. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe, but it's inverted once they take out a lot of the stuff that you don't need mm. and then the nerve endings are still in there so, so you, you can, can have pleasurable sex yes and wow. and then they tend to create the labias from the other two things that used to hang down from the balls the yes. scrotum yeah really You're so good with saying things i'm like happy that. to say it i've got no <laughs> problem with it i oh, have trouble man. sometimes it just gets stuck <laughs> in my little throat don't say balls get stuck in your throat don't say that <laughs> Oh, stop okay, you making so, me blush now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and so I mean, we're, we're laughing about it, but it was a very, very serious operation. Yeah. Like, how many hours did it, it take? It was six and a half hours. Wow. And, and now I think it's streamlined down to three or four now, but amazing. it's done worldwide now, you know, yeah. whereas it was six and a half and um, it was massive surgery and I was in a hospital at Rose Bay for two, two, two and a half weeks. Luckily when the swelling goes it, and it all settles down, it turns into a, exactly what I wanted, a nice little vagina with five-year-old girl labias or something, you know, a tiny labias. That's all I wanted. So did you have any moments of regret of I shouldn't have done this or was it just getting through the pain. The pain was what I, you know, and, and how could I do that to myself because mm. it was extremely bad. But I don't ever remember thinking I wanted my penis back. Not ever, mm. not once, not in the 35 years that I've had it is never once did I think it was a bad thing. It was the best thing for me. So tell me how your family reacted to all of this. I think they were okay about me being maybe gay and being effeminate. They sort of coped with that and, you know, some of the outfits. But as the transitioning started, it sort of became obvious that it was time to have a break, which was very hard at the time because, you know, I loved my family. Mm. But going through the androgy androgynous period seemed to be better that I had a, you know, the family just weren't coping and, you know, there were, it just wasn't nice. I couldn't go home. So you kind of had to have your Oxford Street family yes. to help you through that rough I mean, I, period. They were, I kept in touch with, with them. They knew what was happening, but it just, it was very rare. I was never sure whether I would be able at that point to ever go home again, you know. And That's so heartbreaking. It was, but I also knew that I needed to do what I needed to do for me. It took a while and luckily my... My sister-in-law and, and my nieces, my niece and nephew from my eldest brother, mm. they were the catalyst for the rest of the family to come on board because they would say, you know, she looks good. She's doing really well. 
and you know and you're the same person yes definitely and you know that was the message that I got through them one day that mum and dad want you to go home because they would rather have a daughter than lose their son and you know there were That's beautiful. two other sons before me and one sister so it sort of balanced it out and I ended up being able to go home and it was just perfect it was a beautiful day and you know we've, I've still got photos from that first day back and and you know from that day onwards it was just I was there all the time and everything was fine. What about I remember you telling me that your mum would come to your shows and bring like her bingo ladies. Yeah the, <laughs> it, when we were doing Carlotta's show around the RSL clubs mum would sit there front row and bring all her girlfriends you know I'd go out after the show and sit with her and she goes Carlotta coming out I'm like I'm here mum and she'd be like yeah but is Carlotta coming out I think by that stage she'd gotten so She's used so I was it. just the daughter and Carlotta was, was exciting because <laughs> Carlotta was Carlotta from Beauty and the Beast you know and oh, and yeah. you know so yeah it was great I'd like to take you back and just ask you about the very first time you had sex as a woman was it like losing your virginity yeah very much I, I, you know I, it was about six weeks after the surgery and um, the doctor said you can give it a try and I was like yeah that's not going to happen <laughs> you know I mean it, you wake up with a you know a vagina and I'd never slept with a girl so I, the only vaginas I'd ever seen were in Playboy magazines which is where I got the I want small yeah, labias yeah. you know tiny labias so I, I'd met a boy before the surgery but we were just friends but going through the surgery, we got even closer. And then I think, you know, leading up to it, we, we ended up living together, but we weren't having sex. And then just, I think it was probably, I don't know, six months after, wow. not six weeks, six months after, and we'd been out for a few drinks and I had enough You've courage. <laughs> yes. like, oh my God. I had enough courage and yeah, and it all worked. And, and, you know, I remember the doctor saying, don't be surprised if you don't orgasm the yeah. first time. We don't want you to get upset that it doesn't work. And, but yes, it worked. How do you think it's different for people who are transitioning today? Today, there's just so much more information out there. You know, I mean, there's parents that can see their children at five and six being and acting as a different gender that are aware and educated and, and take those children to see doctors. So there are, um, you know, a lot more information and, and the kids can progress happily without hiding. Do you think um, with people like Bruce Jenner speaking out, it's going to help the trans community? Oh, I hope so. I, I mean, I was a bit, when I first heard about it and thought about it, it did make me hesitate for a second. But then after seeing the interview and, and being able to see that woman inside Bruce, mm. that I just think it might be a positive aspect. There's a lot of older men that didn't have the courage to transition when they were younger. So I think it might help a lot of those people to see an older person transition. So looking back over your life and the hardships and the victories, what advice would you give to someone if they're at that point where they're, they're not sure? What would you say? If they're not sure, they should do what I did. Maybe try and find some other girls that have already started their transition or finished their transition and get some information from them. See some doctors because the doctors are great. Don't try and do it all by yourself. Don't, you know, there's some girls that go online and order their hormones from mm. online and just do it themselves without talking to anyone. That's easy to do in this day and age, but mentally it's not going to help you. You can read everything, but you do need to talk to someone. I, I think the quicker they can talk to a doctor and talk about there, and there are transgender therapists now right. and and if you can talk to one of them they can really help you on the road to transitioning i think that's very important penny thanks for your time thank you